Great. So today I, I'm going to talk to you about some of the regulatory issues, uh, give some context for the workshop today around the Migratory Bird Convention Act and what is take, and as well as our approach to managing take. So I'll talk about incidental take, but also overall population conservation, and I'll try to spend a little bit of time on uh, some of the, the rising list of uh, federal species, uh, species at risk <coughs> that are uh, of concern in, uh, in forests. Okay, so diving in on uh, the Migratory Birds Convention Act. First off, before I get into the nitty gritty, it is the 100 year centennial of this act. It's an amazing piece of legislation to have that history. Um, I have brought commemorative bands for everyone who are good stewards and contribute to migratory bird conservation. So if you haven't got a commemorative band, come by, there's a pile. You can hear them chinking like uh, Marley's chains over uh, by Paul there. <laughs> Appropriate for Christmas. But anyway, back to the uh, nitty gritty of the uh, convention. So this is a piece of legislation here that uh, where uh, killing or harming of birds or destruction or disturbance of nests is a prohibition under the Act. So we have a fairly decent pair piece of legislation here covering uh, migratory birds. And the purpose here, and thus the mandate for us at um, the Canadian Wildlife Service and Environment and Climate Change Canada, is for the protection and conservation of migratory birds as population and individuals and their nests. <coughs> So there are a couple of, or three actually, major prohibitions, both under the Act and the regulations. So under MBCA, there is a prohibition on deposition of, of deleterious substances that might be harmful to birds. And there is two prohibitions under the Migratory Birds Regulation that are of interest to forestry particularly. One is that there's a general prohibition against hunting of, of birds or where hunting can be interpreted as any in attempt in any manner to capture, kill, injure, or harass a migratory bird and a general prohibition on disturbing, destroying, or taking a, net, a, a nest or an egg. And there are also, uh, there's legislation within the provincial government as well that covers migratory birds. So uh, the other little uh, vagary of the act is that, uh, what I uh, is the definition of a migratory bird. So what's included in the migratory bird includes migratory birds, but also non-migratory birds, and also excluded are migratory birds. So you have to get into the, the federal legislation and put yourself 100 years ago in 1916 when the act came together. So included are the migratory game birds, migratory insectivorous birds, so that includes our resident species, our chickadees, nuthatches, woodpeckers as well, uh, as well as other non-game birds, as the seabirds, colonial water birds, uh, the marsh birds. But excluded are things like raptors, uh, the, the corvids, crows, um, blackbirds, things that were considered agricultural pests a uh, hundred years ago and some other species, pelicans, cormorants, kingfishers, things that might have been considered uh, competition for uh, fishers, for example. So that's kind of the mindset, but that's the act as it stands. And when we're talking about incidental take of migratory birds, so under the act, we do have mechanisms to permit take. So we regulate harvest of waterfowl and other species, for example. And there's a number of permits here for scientific, agricultural, damage and danger permits. If the bird is causing economic damage, for example, um, airport taxidermy, uh, eider down collections. Um, but uh, in some circumstances, we do also recognize that the killing or harming of birds or destruction or disturbance of nest and eggs can be uh, can be um, incurred um, unintentionally. And that's what we call incidental take. So this is a regular economic activity, such as forestry or uh, oil and gas exploration or anything that's happening during the breeding season and that can uh, um, incur take. Right now, where we're sitting with the department, our policy, we do not have a mechanism to permit that. So it does remain uh, uh, prohibited. So where we are, are what our, our approach on this as a department is focusing our efforts on providing decision support tools so that proponents can uh, manage to avoid or minimize and manage the risk 
take. So we have four general sets of tools that I'll talk about here around the avoidance guidelines that are on the website. Uh, we've got some uh, scientific tools to help with avoidance and um, of beneficial management practices and then our bird conservation region strategies. And as far as BMPs go, or our, best manage, our beneficial management practices, we can provide these tools to support decision making, but we can't actually endorse a particular BMP as this can constitute a, uh, a fiscally induced error. So that means that uh, the proponent holds the risk and we can give you advice, but we can't actually tell you if you're in compliance with the act or not. So that's the line we walk. So our, our major piece is on the web. Uh, that's probably pretty small for you guys, but there's the website at the top. I'll have it further on in the presentation where we've got a substantial amount of content on our, our advice on avoidance. Um, and the, sub, the focus on the avoidance guidelines are you know, to provide consistent practice across the country on avoiding uh, take. And it focuses on th three areas, you know, when, when you can avoid take, where it's most likely to happen, and how take is most likely to happen. And there's also some science-based tools that we have developed, in particular the, uh, a guideline to when the nesting periods, when you're likely to find breeding birds on the website, and there's now um, a calendar query tool that's hosted at the Bird Studies website as well, and there's uh, also setback guidelines. And I won't talk a lot about the setback guidelines, but there's substantial guidance there on the website as well around uh, how do you create a buffer around a nesting bird to avoid take? And this is a function of you know, when the bird alerts, when it might flush, and uh, as you can imagine, a variety of situations that would, would influence that. Again, it's a situation where the risk is held by the, pr the proponent. So it's the advice on how you might judge what the setback is. And um, you can always phone Paul and ask for, for uh, more details on and advice on specific setbacks for specific species uh, uh, as well. So here's the nesting tool, uh, just briefly. So uh, this tool is being updated and improved with uh, more data and uh, better modeling techniques. We had some discontinuities in the old tool. We've got some more uh, sort of finer resolution regions now. And so you can go in and carve out, you know, figure out where your activity occurs in, in which zone and look at our best estimates of when you would find the majority of breeding activity. So these windows are an example for uh, about 90% of the breeding birds that, that you would find. And you can go in and generate on the nesting tool site on at the Birth Studies Canada, uh, you know, pull your specifications for your habitat type, for your zone, and look at the, uh, the number of species and, and percentage of when you'd see the highest activity. There is variation around this, there'll be annual variation, and of course there are some species that aren't covered, like finches that would be responding to a cone crop or things like that are going to fall outside this. So. Um, these are model-based tools, and they are derived from, um, from a substantial uh, database from Project Nestwatch that's hosted at Bird Studies Canada. Um, I, you know, in anticipation of this presentation, I asked uh, those folks, and this is led by Bruno Gerlet in the Canadian Wildlife Service, of what were the scientific needs they saw around this tool in, in particular in giving better advice. And the big piece was just trying to improve the database where we are lacking um, uh, nesting records for birds to improve the tool. So it is a very large data set as it, as it stands. Uh, this has got 240,000 nest records with 640,000 observations for 335 bird species. Um, but we still have a back backlog. So we've got all our prairie nest record scheme that we're trying to get into that system. So adding new data to that will only increase the strength of this tool.
We're trying to uh, update the estimation of the nest chronologies through a back calculation, which is essentially around the, the variation that you estimate when you, from when you know the laying date or when you observe the fledging date. Um, so using a new nest package called, um, from R called R-Nest, I will not get into that, but I have a long 87-page deck uh, on that, should anyone be interested. Um, and in general, we're trying to um, improve the estimates of an, uh, the nesting phenology through the model-based approach, first to reduce the sampling bias. There are a lot of common species in this database, lots of robins, for example. So trying to inc include the, improve the records of the rare species and to provide estimates uh, where there's a lack of data. So not surprisingly, the boreal is, is a gap. So we need your nest records, graduate students. Um, and in the longer term, we know that uh, arrival dates, uh, laying dates, are going to be influenced by climate change, so that's a longer term effort to uh, improve uh, estimates there. And uh, ongoing peer review here with experts is our other challenge, particularly for uh, things like waterfowl uh, and water birds. So that's the story on where we're standing with avoidance of take. Um, and we can see for forestry, do I have a pointer? I'm not even going to try it, I'm going to wreck it. Uh, but you can see with forestry, um, you know, where we're sitting, uh, the estimate of the tally for take is about a million birds. And um, so if we did total avoidance of that and, and manage that, would we have conservation of birds? You know, we know the boreal produces billions and billions of birds, right? So. I have to say, uh, I, I don't believe so. I think we have to go for, farther if we're talking about conservation of birds and forests. And I think we all know in this room that uh, habitat alteration, habitat change is the big story here. And I'm just using an example from work from uh, Lisa Mahan and, um, and Aaron. You're showing you know, pretty compelling evidence from the Athabasca oil sands area, but it looks at forestry and energy impacts and that we're seeing, you know, comparing uh, a, dis a no disturbance situation in the green versus our current disturbed landscape, that we're seeing winners and losers in this landscape and in general that the losers are uh, old growth forest, uh, coniferous forest or uh, some black spruce species specialists and the winners are deciduous, um, are young deciduous, open country birds and, and generalists. And that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship that we're seeing that, so the statistic here is that for, you know, essentially a doubling where, I know where it's witnessed an overall 15% change in the bird community compared to an 8.4% uh, disturbance on this landscape. And that we know that both energy and forestry are having an impact here on, on species and that these can be uh, synergistic. And this is again from the same uh, paper from uh, Lisa and Aaron, you know, showing that these, there are uh, responses to both harvesting and to individual practices uh, from oil and gas. And that when these, uh, when these uh, practices uh, interact, that they can have even greater effect uh, on birds. So uh, from the departmental perspective, we advocate uh, development of uh, best management practices and conservation plans. So we're very supportive of that. I will give you the departmental line here with this slide around that you know, we recognize that this is a benefit uh, to helping to avoid and mitigate uh, impacts on birds, that when we're developing conservation plans, we encourage inclusion of avoidance and conservation recommendations. Again, it's up to individuals and companies to identify those practices for BMPs uh, to avoid contravening Migratory Birds Convention Act. And again, we will give you a advice and review, but we don't uh, have authority to say that your BMP will uh, keep you in compliance with the Act. So 
what, what we can provide in support is certainly to provide you know, scientific background on migratory birds, the ecology and management needs. We have a number of science staff and regulatory experts. We actively participate in and and support scientific collaboration and generate science as well. Uh, we can help with interpretation of recommended objectives and conservation actions. We have uh, bird conservation region plans. I have the ginormous um, BCR6, which is the Boreal uh, Plains uh, conservation plan at the decks, uh, desk there if you want to um, take a look at it. And uh, we can provide feedback on specific best management practices for minimizing take and achieving conservation objectives. And there's, guide there's guidelines online again. So the, the BCR plans, um, those are bird conservation region strategies. So the one relevant here for discussion today would be around BCR6. There's good guidance there, uh, particularly so priority species. Those are defined by um, you know, uh, issues of conservation concern. So do we have uh, regulatory um, requirements for them? Uh, are they declining species? Are they, do we have, you know, most of that species occurs in the area, as well as information about habitats, population objectives, the threats, conservation objectives, and, and actions there, so some of the practices that would support uh, migratory birds. But looking at that as a guideline and thinking about overall, you know, what are the science needs to improve planning? I think there's a fairly um, decent list of, of work for us that, that I hope we can dive into um, today. And I think a lot of the uh, presentations today will give us some insight on, on where we're at. The first uh, obvious point seems to me to expand and stabilize our long-term monitoring for status and trends uh, of birds. You know, so we know who is declining, increasing, what are our distribution, some of these basic tools we need for planning. And we have you know, uh, a decent uh, baseline. We have programs uh, underway within CWS and within ABMI, but it's stabilizing those and expanding them so that they are covering uh, species of, of conservation concern. I think we need to improve our science for conservation planning, so making sure we have decent data for habitat associations and the appropriate disturbance and other covariates that, that are required for modeling species disturbance and, and habitat relationships. So we can use these as predictive tools. And I think we've made some progress there, but um, I'm sure uh, through the talks today we'll, we'll see further gaps and, and work there. And I think, you know, in terms of understanding avian response to management actions, we need to work on that across scales. We've made some tremendous um, gains there, especially through investments from uh, oil sands monitoring. But I would like to make sure that if we are giving advice and asking industry to change practices, that we can stand behind those practices and really know that those are contributing to population conservation. So I see ongoing need for focus study there and, and validation. We need to continue to incorporate temporal aspects. So we need the simulations, we need the habitat supply through time so we can test and see what happens to populations. And as well to incorporate climate change, which is um, you know, some of the early simulations coming out from the Boreal Avian Modeling Project are um, distressing, I would say to say the least, and certainly concerning. So it's not enough just to look at habitat change anymore, especially um, as we look forward uh, through the next hundred years or less. And we need to improve a a accessibility. I see, um, you know, the demands for open data and how challenging that is, how much time that takes, but it's a place we need to go. And for open collaboration, because there's not enough time and not enough resources to do this. So um, within CWS, we very much consider ourselves working in partnerships and are interested in always increasing those with the limited capacity that we have. And the other aspect here is I've talked about the science needs, but I recognize that there are policy needs as well because science isn't going to fill all the gaps. And 
I think this was made very clear to me by work by uh, Lisa, Aaron, and, and others in this publication where they tried to take the population objectives that you'll see in the bird conservation region plans. Those are set what we call aspirationally. Because we don't have habitat-based conservation or population objectives, we, are, uh, we use this aspirational objective of saying, let's put populations back to where they were in the 1960s. Uh, you know, and that might work for the boreal, but it doesn't work for southern Ontario, you know, the, the, where large cities aren't going away or we're not going back to those times. And so uh, this example here is just a, a downscaling of taking those population objectives to the scale of something like a forest tenure of the Alpac. FMA and saying, you know, if we took the timber supply from Alpac and tweaked it to add in protected areas or look at climate change, would we hit our proposed population objective? And for something like the black throated green warbler, we, we very quickly don't, we very quickly start to decline and miss it. So uh, even when we throw in something like protected areas that we think would help, help concern, so we can see, you know, quite enormous measures would be required here. So that sparks the conversation about how much is enough uh, and, um, and where are our policy stances on that uh, provincially and, and nationally. Yes, oh, I'm wrapping it up, okay. Uh, just quickly on uh, species at risk. Here, there's three species that I think are real interest for us today, the Canada warbler, common nighthawk, and olive-sided flycatcher. Uh, these are species uh, that are listed as threatened under Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act, and threatened is a uh, special status uh, that, that um, takes, uh, it, it draws everyone's attention. Um, there are permits under Species at Risk Act, but not for migratory birds, because that would uh, contra contravene the Migratory Birds Convention Act. So again, there are no permits for these species. And where we're at with these species, because they are threatened, they require a recovery strategy. Those recovery strategies are published, but critical habitat is not identified yet on those species. So there's a schedule of studies that should lead us towards critical habitat identification by, I think, 2021 or 2022. Um, so critical habitat, that's the habitat necessary to, for the survival and recovery of the species to reach the population and distribution objectives. And just to clarify for the federal position on, um, on critical habitat, we would be seeking to protect critical habitat through the provincial and, and uh, our, on provincial lands like crown lands or private lands through stewardship or provincial laws. So it would be very rare for us uh, to step in. Um, so for the schedule of studies, that is underway. That's uh, now a scientific collaboration with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. So Nicole will talk a little bit about that, but that's really just uh, starting up. And I see that's another area of discussion about you know, ongoing scientific need for data to improve and validate our, our, our predictions. So the Boreal Avian Modeling Project and various projects have a lot to contribute. I think um, we'll see ongoing demands there. Uh, so in, I'll summarize and wrap up where I see our science needs around the nesting calendar, so contribution of nesting data and ongoing model improvements inc and incorporation of climate change. For conservation planning, either regionally through our BCR plans or locally at the level of forest tenure, I think we need to improve our population modeling, our monitoring, uh, improve our habitat association and those data layers necessary for prediction, um, continue to understand avian response for management practices, get the habitat supply scenarios, because once we've got these fantastic models, we need something to apply them through through time and predict and, and understand the outcome of our management decisions, as well as promote open data and accessibility. Okay, thank you.